have a story. In fact, we are a story. Our stories shape and influence every dimension of daily life and relationships. I'm Rachel Clinton Chen, co-host of the Allender Center podcast. Here at the Allender Center, we believe that knowing the impact of our stories and finding God's redemptive work within them can transform not only our own lives, but the ways we engage the world around us. One of our greatest joys at the Allender Center is to be able to lead and support people just like you through engaging your own story at our story workshops. When you participate in a story workshop, you'll experience teaching from Allender Center instructors and guidance of small group facilitators who will help you explore your own story and the themes of your life in a supportive environment. If you are looking to understand your story more deeply and to learn more about how it intersects with the story of the gospel, then the story workshop is for you. No matter the harm you've endured, there is hope for restoration. There is hope for a renewed vitality of your own life. It's not easy work, but it has never been more important to gain such a crucial understanding of your own story. If you are ready to step boldly into your unique and deeply beautiful story, then reserve your spot today to participate in one of our upcoming story workshops at the allendercenter.org slash events. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. We have a creator God who has called us uh, to be like him. And part of that is we are called to be creative, to actually have a sense both of wisdom, uh, honor, and delight about being able to make, to make uh, excellent chocolate chip cookies. I'm thinking about that particularly because it's near lunch. But further, to be able to make movement, to be able to make a vision of something that didn't exist, now it exists, in order to reveal not only the creator, but the one who creates in that particular craft. And we've got, Rachel, two really crafty people with us, really crafty. Yeah, we are incredibly fortunate today to be joined by Melissa and Jordan Dowell. And I am going to take the opportunity to let you know a little bit about Melissa and I'll let Dan introduce Jordan. Although I just want to throw out there that uh, I actually met Jordan first um, when he was trying to discern whether or not uh, he wanted to come to the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. But that's a story for another day. But Melissa is a friend and colleague um, here at the Allender Center. She is the manager of product development. She's honestly just incredibly brilliant and creative, even in our work and what could be possible. She's also an actor. And this is one of the things I love about you, Melissa, that you um, you have this whole other world. And I will let her talk more about this, but she actually just finished a production of Pride and Prejudice, um, where she had the lead role of Miss Elizabeth Bennett, and it was a uh, unique production of Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, I got to be there. I got to be seven rows back. I wanted to be on the front row <laughs> so that I could Google eye. So, yeah, it was so dull. I mean, it was one of the sweet gifts of the whole year. Uh, I've been waiting a long time to watch Melissa perform. Uh, so, we're going to talk about the craft of what it means to be an actress, what it means to take on roles uh, in the realm of being able to transmit thought, feeling, uh, character. But I get to introduce Jordan. And Jordan, I, to me, I, I'll just start with a level of grief that we have never been able yet to fly fish together. Mm-hmm. So that, that to me is the, the, the first designation. Uh, you are a fly fisherman. Uh, And in that, the creativity and the genius is immense. In addition, um, though 
Jordan has a degree from the Seattle School. Uh, he wisely decided to, in one sense, express the nature of his creativity in the midst of making stunning, stunning furniture. And to be able to say, uh, you, you're a craftsman, you're an artist, and you're a carpenter. And in that, uh, the beauty uh, you create will, will certainly give people access to be able to look at some of your brilliant productions. But all that to say, you guys are pretty creative, aren't you? I would say so. I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> Own it. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if there's a, a, a fundamental question in this other than to say – you're one of the most creative couples that we know. How how does that play out, you know, uh, having an early morning coffee when the <laughs> box of Cheerios, uh, you know, has been like put back in the pantry, but uh, is fairly empty? <laughs> <laughs> I like that you said early morning coffee um, as if that exists for me. Um, <laughs> I would say mid-morning um, that's where my creativity lies is how long, how can I, how long can I stay in bed before it's too long? <laughs> I, I did bring early morning up with some awareness, by the way. I think part of, part of being a creative is knowing when your best hours are and, and, and taking advantage of that, utilizing your creativity when you're at your best mm -hmm. and knowing when you need to refuel and reset, which for me is early morning <laughs> yeah yeah being a creative is is all about listening listening to your body mm -hmm. um but i i think in the situation you painted of making coffee making breakfast uh creativity is an invitation to uh, to listen to everything mm -hmm. and uh look for the story in any sort of materiality that we find ourselves interacting with so certainly the coffee and the story there um yeah listening first to our that, that does sound like we're we're <clears throat> deeply philosophical every morning and that is very very rare right yeah <laughs> that'll happen after the first cup of coffee but yeah, yeah, but yeah. the invitation's there the invitation is there <laughs> in every cup of coffee so i think one of the things i'm getting at let, let's see if i can put words better to it than i have it, it creativity doesn't start for you all and stop for you all uh it's part of your way of being in the world which shows in certain particularity like on a stage or in your studio working on a piece of furniture but how mm. did you ah how did you come to recognize and own that creative impulse mm. well i i appreciate this question because you said earlier we're one of the most creative couples you know but it's hard for me to say that I or we are more creative than any other couple or any other person on the planet because we are we are created and creative beings in this world. Um, I don't think anyone is more or less creative than anyone else. I think that we've uh, I've had the joy of contemplating our creativity a bit more, especially in the work that Jordan does and, and even just finding where theater and acting lives in my world. Um, I pursued, um, I, I have a degree in musical theater and it's not my career. It's not what pays my bills. And to come to go on that journey of deciding that, that theater wouldn't be my career but that it had to be a part of my life mm -hmm. for me to survive, for me to be alive and and thriving in this world. Um, it was a it was a it was a journey. It was an interesting journey. Um, but I think that's where, for me, I started to realize like, oh, this is this is vital to my being, and to have that outlet and to kind of explore that outside of what was picked, what was painted for me from a degree program of like, here's how you become a career actor. Here's how you 
go out into the world, depending on which market you want to be a part of and, and make this your career. And I think we, we've said this before, like to ask your craft to pay your bills is a lot to ask of your craft. Um, so for me, it doesn't pay my bills, but it, it keeps me alive. Mm-hmm. And yet, yeah. Jordan, y- your craft does pay a good portion of your bills. Mm-hmm. So I- I'd yeah. love to hear a bit. How did you come into being a, and is it fair just to use the word, a fine furniture maker? Oh, that is, that is, a, that is a, generous, <laughs> a generous label, but I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I came into this craft uh, in somewhat of a back door. Uh, in that I, you know, I went to Bible school and seminary, worked for a number of years in the church, and then, and then, became a furniture maker. And Wait. what I tell people that I'm, I'm reverse engineering the Jesus career. <laughs> I did the ministry up front, and I then, love it. The Benjamin and Button, the, the Benjamin Button, oh, yes. Yes. ministry. Benjamin career. Button, yes. Um, and now, and now, I like to add that since I've crossed into the 34 year threshold. I know that this is a good path. <laughs> this is <laughs> well, it, 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 it put, uh, put words to how that path occurred. Yeah, yeah. I Well, Melissa and I were engaged to be married. We were living in Chicago. And I, well, I grew up around woodworking. So my dad built houses, builds houses. My His dad built houses. And so I grew up around carpentry. And uh, my dad, in, in particular, is a is a Finnish carpenter, so more more fine carpentry, mm-hmm. um, sort of the furniture finishing aspects of a house. And when Melissa and I were engaged, uh, as engaged couples do, we went out to Crate and Barrel and we started looking at furniture. And then we looked at the prices and we thought, this is this is never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Buying the furniture on our uh, on our on our ministry <laughs> salaries at the time. Uh, and I just, I, I also had this stirring sense that I could, you know, however arrogant or misplaced it was, I I just thought I I can make this stuff. I can do this. I can call my dad and ask for some used tools. And, um, so quite literally I, I did that. I drove from Chicago to Michigan and picked up some basic tools and then started designing furniture. And then our, our, the church that we worked at was in the, the downtown area of Chicago was in the loop and it had this great loading dock in the back. And I would set up after Wednesday night youth groups and I would make furniture and just something really started to come alive in me as I really, once again, because as a kid, I made all sorts of stuff. And then now as a young adult, anticipating being married, making a home with Melissa, I was again, making making the home, making the the things that would adorn this home and make this home possible. And I really felt myself come alive in a deep way that I hadn't known. Um, and then from there, you know, I started putting pictures online of furniture and, and, uh, and sold a couple pieces here and there. And I thought, well, I will, I will lean into this even more. So nearly nine years later, uh, this is, this is what I'm doing. When I'm just thinking about, I guess, where I find myself um, thinking is like, what would you say differentiate? Because there's a certain like discipline and, and an intentionality and stewardship of creativity and gifting in both of what you do. Like, you know, Melissa, you're saying I went, I have a musical theater degree. Like um, there was a you know, what are some of the ways you've shaped, um, you continue to shape your craft? And I, but then I'm also thinking about like, what's the difference? How would we talk about the difference between like, say a hobby and ways we kind of mm-hmm. live into our creativity in a hobby versus something that, that really becomes a craft? Um, and what has, what has, how would you think about that in your own life? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, think I I think there's a lot of as people picture crafts and and there there was definitely a movement especially in 2020 during the pandemic when <laughs> we were all trapped in our homes the idea of hobbies and crafts just exploded because people needed something to do um and 
I don't really, I don't necessarily differentiate between the two that much. I don't think, I think it really, something becomes a craft when you, when you actually take this time and space to consider what it, what it takes to, to do the thing that you're doing. So making dinner can be a chore, but making dinner can be a craft. And it's, and it's Mm. really in the, in the way that you pause and and take a look around at the materials at the at at what what's before you that it that it starts to shift and it starts to change um so um i think i think of craft as just what where do you i mean there's definitely hobbies and crafts that i've explored that i've tried out i'm sure you know there's always the like didn't everybody try to do sourdough bread? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I could never get my yeah. I could never get a starter actually. No, <laughs> no we couldn't either. We couldn't either. I tried so, so hard. We're, <laughs> for us, we're like, you know, this is probably not gonna become a craft for us unless we really wanted to invest and spend the time and energy into it. But um for other people, well I mean, well done. Um so yeah, so I think. If I were to differentiate, I think you can try out a hobby. And I think when when it becomes a part of you and you connect to it in some way with your soul, mm-hmm. that's where you tap into like, oh, this is a craft. This is a this is a, an extension of myself. Mm-hmm. And maybe in a way that a part of myself I haven't experienced mm-hmm. before, or it's a part of myself that I don't get to spend a lot of time with because of life. Mm-hmm. Um calling you to lots of different you're calling for your attention in lots of different ways Mm -hmm. um I think yeah you you step into craft when you when you start to step into your own soul and 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 gets to participate with the material with the ingredients with the tomato that Mm -hmm. you're that you're using for your dinner um it, it shifts it's a it's a mindset shift yeah yeah and I even you know I will often tell people that because I make furniture for most of my day and I I make furniture to pay my bills, I actually find myself needing other crafts as sort of a a ritual aspect. Because really, to me, it seems like we're talking about the way that craft shapes us ritually. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so for me, cooking is Mm -hmm. is often that. Um, You know, cooking brings me uh, to my senses in a different way than I might be operating as I'm filling an order for a customer. Um, you know, or, um, yeah, it it brings me to, to, uh, interact with my own body, but also the embodiedness of, you know, the, the ingredients, um, or gardening. I mean, just a couple days ago, it finally got sunny here in the Northwest and, (laughs) So we're we're planting things, and and there's just something about allowing that craft um, to bring you into the world in a in a different way, in a more soulful way. Mm-hmm. Um, I find myself thinking, saying that uh, craft brings you into the world body first, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's so different from how we enter, you know, much of our our work lives, our day to day lives. We enter head first, you know, but craft brings you in body first. Uh, and and then allows you to cultivate this this uh, relationship of reciprocity with the material world. Mm. Well, I love that. What's making me think about is like I'm. I would say because I've been thinking, do I have a craft? Like I definitely have. Like you know, I would say like homiletics is a craft. You know, like the art of preaching. Mm-hmm. Like that's one of my crafts. Mm-hmm. And the only other one I can think of that's like a true craft is is. I wouldn't say gardening because most of it's in it's maybe gardening with like potted plants and indoor plants. But I remember the moment. I mean, I think what you guys are talking about, like Melissa, your words of like something you didn't even realize you needed, like in order to like, it has to be a part of your life. And Jordan, your words of like this engagement with the material world in a way that like helps you move body first. I got my first, I would have said, in 2015, I got my first plant and I would have told you, I don't have a green thumb. I can't keep a thing alive. And I got my first plant when I had foot surgery. <laughs> and I was also in like a very 
I was healing from a lot of trauma too at the time uh, from an assault, like intentionally going to therapy, which I kind of had to do after my foot surgery. And I got my first plant and I had like three or four plants for a good six months. And I killed three of the four plants in the first six (laughs) months Um, because I didn't realize that plants had different types of soil they needed, different types of sunlight, different levels of water, like that they each had different needs and varied needs. And I remember I kept like one plant alive and the way in which it just brought me, it was teaching me about healing and tending to the small and paying attention. And it just Mm -hmm. brought me so much life. And then, you know, when I got married, I had like over 70 plants and (laughs) I only got to take um, one third of them across the cut. Like we only had space in our tiny U-Haul for like one third of them. So I ended up having to gift a lot of friends who I trusted to take care of my plant we babies. Have one. Yeah, you do have, we one. have one of your, your plants. Yes. You do have one. And I just it's doing well. Yeah. I kind of, I think I'm, yeah, Dan, I didn't mean to cut you off. So I'll make space. I'm just thinking about that connection between the creativity, like the spirituality of craft of like making something of building something of tending to something has a real healing integrating aspect to it like it does like that sense you just said of like mutually giving back and shaping you like Mm. I would have never thought of myself as like a plant lady but the ways in which I will always have to have something green I live in a concrete jungle but I have green all over my house on every outdoor space is covered with green um and that is that has been deeply healing and restorative to me and I didn't know that about myself till I was 35 years old. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. And Rachel, you, you paint such a, a beautiful picture kind of coming off of what Melissa talked about, like in the pandemic, we all took on new crafts, mm-hmm. uh, started a sourdough starter. And a lot of people use this phrase, like it gave them a sense of control because everything was out of control. But I, I think that crafts and crafts like what you're talking about and keeping plants tending to a sourdough starter, it actually teaches us a manner of surrender Mm -hmm. and reciprocity, a a different way to to think about our own power in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Something much different than just control. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, I'd love to know how you approach uh, a piece of wood or how you approach a part of a dialogue of a character. I'm going to go first. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, what I've, this, and when I was deciding to go to school for musical theater, it certainly was coming from a place of, I love performing. I love attention. I love to make people <laughs> laugh, but I didn't, I don't know why it just was something I enjoyed. I was good at it. I liked it. Why, why spend your time doing something you dislike if you could spend your time doing something you love? Mm-hmm. So that's, that was kind of like what, sent me into um into the theater space um and from there into the improv comedy space but um what was really interesting about this was uh my second post-pandemic play this was Pride and Prejudice this was Elizabeth Bennett who is truly one of my all-time favorite characters someone I never expected to be cast as um I have historically played very wacky characters, uh, all uh, borderline inhuman (laughs) caricatures of humans. Um, If you look at, if you were to look at my acting resume, there would be a lot of very silly people on it. Um, So this was, and this was a very funny comedic farcical version of Pride and Prejudice, but um, I wasn't playing one of the wacky characters. There were definitely wacky characters in the show and I wasn't playing one of them. And this was a very um, new experience for me. And one that highlighted things that I knew about theater and what theater can offer, but hadn't really like lived into it or experienced it myself, um, which is that theater is a, is storytelling. It's telling a story. It's, inviting an audience to a shared experience and hopefully a cathartic experience. So like all, all good theater, the hope is to lead the audience to a moment of catharsis Mm -hmm. in some way, whether it's laughing, 
at the absurd, being grateful that that tragedy is not yours, <laughs> bringing you to a sense of gratitude or, um, or, or seeing your own story played out in a way that maybe you hadn't before through the use of characters, through the use of sta brilliant staging and lighting and music and all the elements that come together to put on a, a performance, a production. Um, so this, I mean, Pride and Prejudice is a love story. I am so grateful to have, to have experienced my own love story, but also currently experiencing it. Um, and to, to play this character who is, who is going through that again, of of uncertainty with the world that they're being brought up in the um the society that is requiring certain things of them to kind of navigate that as this character um it it calls you to a sense of empathy that that is of the creator um to understand this character's backstory, to create a backstory for a character if there's not one provided in the script. Like, why would she say no to this proposal that would ensure her future, that would ensure um, her stability and safety for the rest of her life? Like, there, there are, um, it requires a curiosity for another person i'll say it's a character story um that that is that that invites me to be more curious of of the people around me story it, it's mm -hmm. it's a deeply um it's a practice in empathy it's a practice mm -hmm. in curiosity mm -hmm. um and it also allows me to play emotions that maybe i don't let myself feel on a regular basis in my real life not the love part. I, I do feel that all the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, there were, there, I remember after one of our performances of Pride and Prejudice, there were some older women that came up to us after the show. Um, and obviously they were not alive during the 18 teens when this, this show takes place. But they said to us, like, it was so wonderful to see this production on stage because when we were growing up, the the things we were allowed to do mm -hmm. and not allowed to do the way that we were the, the, even the rights or the rules that we had in our society um, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, it, like they could see their own story playing out mm -hmm. and they actually got to watch a woman take control of her, her future in a way that maybe they weren't allowed to. And it was cathartic for them. So that was so that was so meaningful for me. It was such it's such a gift to share a story with an audience. Mm -hmm. Such a gift mm -hmm. to be able to um, invite people in. We, one of the things we said about the show too is that we wanted it to be beautiful and fun and funny because if you're gonna leave your house, if you're gonna spend your money, if you're gonna go see something it should feel good. Let's mm. make it feel, we need more moments of feeling good in this world. And so it was, it was really delightful to, to get to bring that to the stage. Well, the intersection between exposure of structure, systems, misogyny, uh, and a wretched uh, marriage that she's engaging with regard to her family, again, not to take us too far into Pride and Prejudice, but in some <laughs> ways, to create the interplay between humor and heartache um, and to expose. It's genius. And uh, I'll just say, your playing that character was so lovely and so compelling. So, mm. Jordan, when, how, how do you approach a piece of wood? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I resonate with so much of what you are saying, Melissa, that uh, my practice too becomes uh, an invitation to step into empathy. To you know, my craft is a study of empathy and how um, you know how how the tree that uh, that gave up its its life for the material that I'm using how um, how the story of that tree came to be. Um, you know, there there's an invitation in all of our 
crafts to attend to the just the story nature of the world. Yes. And then to think about how how it all comes mm. to belong in, you know, I, I think a lot about belonging and home as I, I create products for the home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I create and one of my uh, one of the main products that I make is actually a, a, a really beautiful dog house. <laughs> you know, so, I, so it's also I there's, there's something about more than the more than human world that I'm making home for. Um, and and so there's um, there's delight and play there uh but really i think i approach i approach my craft as uh as as a way that i find my own belonging and participate with the belonging of of the material um you know there's something and the the poets say this much better of you know entering the world in a as a as a conversational sort of reality Mm. that everything is speaking to you everything is speaking to you and whether it's the tomato or it's coffee, you know, uh, there or or wood or an opportunity to be on stage, there is an opportunity to move through the world conversationally, uh, to participate in the belonging of of everything. And uh, I'm grateful that I get to do that with wood, with beautiful material. Well, it, there's an intersection here between you are a creator, but also you're a servant and you serve the role creatively. But to do that, what I'm hearing at least is there is, a, and you said it so well, Jordan, a surrender, a submission, a giving in to what is true about the piece of wood or the dialogue uh, in a play. And that intersection between, you're not in control, but you you are creating, and yet simultaneously you're also surrendering to what your sense of the other script, actors, actresses, wood, product is calling forth. Is that am I mm. in a frame? Yeah, the whole I mean, all of our crafts exist in some sort of paradox, mm. you know, where we are in my case, I'm using material. Um, or if we are cooking, we are we are taking a vegetable or a piece of meat and that is that has come from an animal that has had a life outside of where we are taking it in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's a there's a taking and a giving. Um, and I think I mean craft just brings you body first in a very visceral way to that relationship. Um, yeah, that in a, in a way that if we are just consuming our way through, through life, uh, we miss that relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm well, where, where I went, just, <laughs> just thinking about <laughs> how cooking ain't never going to be a craft for me because I just like, I look at your boards, <laughs> Melissa, like it's a mindset shift. I was like, nope, nope, not with cooking. It's just, it's just not, I am not. <laughs> It doesn't come intuitively to me. It's where I'm not a good Italian woman. I don't, I'm sure there's trauma stories here. I know there, I mean, I'm sure there's a reason, but it's just like, but I, I love consuming food. So I was more thinking about my husband, I would say like has a craft of like cooking and I love watching him do exactly what you're saying. Like, ponder the ingredients and and there's a, an art to it and a creativity to it and i'm like give me a recipe i can follow it i will <laughs> practice a thousand times to make this one thing that i know how to make without having to think about it <laughs> but like that took me a good seven years to figure out how to make that one thing that i don't have to think about but if you're like what would you do if you didn't have those ingredients i have no idea so i it just had me thinking about um but because I, because I am in the presence of someone who's bringing their craft to me, then I'm invited mm-hmm. to encounter food differently than just consuming it, right? And so it was making me think about how our crafts, though so often are done, you know, in some ways, not in complete isolation, they're often done in community. But there's also something about bringing our craft to the world that invites people into an experience that they may not 
it may not be their primary way of being creative, but there's, there's something that they get to be invited mm -hmm. into a different experience too, that it disrupts some of that mm -hmm. consumption too. So I was feeling grateful. <laughs> I don't have to be, um, I don't have to be a cook and yeah. I still get to enjoy, um, the craft of incredible cooking. <laughs> It, yet that it, it does pose the question again, if we can go back to this difference between craft and hobby. Um, in, in one sense, what I'm hearing so far is that for the two of you, craft is not just connected to your soul, which it is, and to a level of relationship, it is, and to a larger, but also a focus story, which again, those are really amazing categories. Well, already, I don't think that's true for those who have hobbies. But mm. there is, if I can put it this way, a submission to the craft to, in some sense, bear the danger of failing, to actually not primarily control, but in one sense, submit to a process in getting better is an acknowledgement that there is much growth yet to be gained, mm -hmm. which is that, mm -hmm. again, tension of, like, it's a big risk to get mm -hmm. on stage. I can't mm -hmm. help but think it's a huge mm -hmm. risk to begin to create a new product that you're going to try out and see how it goes the first, second, 50th times. So how do you both look at the issue of danger in the context of your craft? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, for me, the danger is, it's what is the most fun for me. It's, <laughs> it's live theater, especially, and I mentioned improv comedy. I mean, improv comedy, you're going on stage with nothing, no script. Mm. <laughs> you're going up with no script, no, no pre-established character, nothing. Only the only thing you have, unless you're doing a one person show, the only thing you have is the relationship to the other people mm -hmm. on stage. And it requires immense trust. And um, it, it takes practice. There, I mean, I, there's, there's no denying like a craft is honed, is something to be honed through work and practice and learning and curiosity. Um, but, I, and I've done, a, ooh, I've done some bad shows. I've done some <laughs> bad improv shows i've done some i've done some some terrible things have happened on the stage <laughs> and yet you go back up but but when it works <laughs> when it works i mean it's the it's the it's the four plants like three of them died one of them lived mm -hmm. and that one that lived it's everything it, you know the one that the the moment that you and your scene partner just are clicked in together and you create something from nothing together on stage. It, it's dangerous, but that's, I mean, it's, it's the thrill. It, I'm Dan, you ride motorcycles. I mean, you're talk about danger. Like it's where the, it's where the, the life it's that, it's that, that fine line between life and death mm. that, that makes it sweet. Yeah, and but to distinguish, uh, I, I'm willing to take the danger of dying on the road. Um, but this conversation, which should have been there in my body and thought well before, but I'm like, um, when Rachel said, what's my craft? And I'm going, like, if you could see the painting behind her, it's a... Glorious <laughs> <laughs> bouquet of flowers. And indeed, you know, I had the privilege of being in your place in Seattle, and it was a forest. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But I would, is, when you ask that, I'm going, oh, so it's my craft. Um, <laughs> and, and the first word was, oh, well, I write. And I'm like, yeah, it's a craft, but it's not really. Uh, 
it, it's if I were to say the few strokes of the keyboard where I've begun to play with fiction now now I can feel my stomach turn and I can feel the danger the idea of getting on the bike and riding yeah I'm aware yeah I think sometimes these conversations can sort of uh border on the line where we're trying to create like a barometer of what is craft what isn't uh and I I just I don't think if if it can be done it's not my, my calling to do so <laughs> um but I'd like what you said Melissa that it you know craft it it pulls you to the life mm -hmm. um to the the and and there's something in the um life always feels dangerous yes when you when you really get up and see it and um yeah so there's there's an aspect of uh the the danger the danger is is why we do it <laughs> um you know because that that possibility of failure um really means you're walking close to that edge of of life and death mm -hmm. um there's a you know craft brings you to a frontier every time you whether you start a meal or you start a production or you start a a, a piece of furniture you're on a frontier mm. where you are going to get to witness something come to life yeah it, it's the risk the risk isn't just like i i watched over 46 years my wife create staggering beauty in her cross stitch and yeah initially she used patterns but after three or four um she stopped she started creating taking the risk of taking time energy to begin a process of outlining it and then seeing how it plays out from an outline on a piece of paper into the realm. So I think there is this element of there is risk and danger. There is submission. There is this capacity to be shaped by your craft. Like you are doing your craft, but your craft is actually shaping you. So I, mm -hmm. before we end, I would love for you to put words to how has it shaped you? Uh, in your spirituality, yeah, I, um, I mean, I, th I think this, this brings me to a conversation, a thought about uh, the Lord's Supper, and I think it has shaped me to realize um, I, I do believe the story of God is one that invites us to be participants as creatives, as craftspeople in this world, and I think. Uh, for me, it it radically shaped the way I see that ritual of the Lord's Supper. That these these items are brought to a table that that um, are not just these static items. They are bread that is involved in an entire community of people. Certainly, in an ancient an ancient setting, entire community of people of of migrating farm workers who tended to fields who picked picked uh ripe grapes you know and and then within wine like there's this all of society from people uh and, and in poverty to wealthy landowners are sort of all brought together in this meal yes and and this meal is so laborious to make it, it takes so many people to take wine to make wine and somehow all of that matters in god's program in in god's table and so to be able to to then take that experience that ritual experience and realize it really matters the way i go about making the world and making the world is so much more than just making furniture it is mm. making dinner it is the life we create together melissa and i it's the life we create as a community uh, but it all matters so deeply mm. melissa yeah um, I think the way it has shaped, certainly shaped me is in, in diving into a character that is different than myself. Um, prior to Pride and Prejudice, I played a, sh I was in a show where I played, there's a character who was described as a homicidal maniac, <laughs> a, 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 quite literally a murderer, a mass, a, a mass murderer in this play that was, uh, it was a, it was a comedy murder mystery farce thing but 
to bring a level of what what makes a person resort to this? What was this person's childhood like? I, I mean, none of this was in the script, but it was the only way that I could play this character with any level of humanity is to try to understand what they had lived through and why they would resort to that because you have to uh i had to love this person Mm -hmm. and embody this person um to look at any characters things you like about them and things you don't like about them but to understand why they are the way that they are Mm -hmm then invites me, Melissa, to consider the world around me and the people around me, the person that ticks me off for whatever reason, you know, um, to consider with more empathy, like, what is this person going through? What has this person gone through in their childhood? What has this gone person gone through in the last 20 minutes that would have them cut me off rudely in the parking lot? I mean, you know, even something small like that, but it changes the way that I can uh, consider consider the other, consider my neighbor, mm-hmm. and to then ultimately love my neighbor. Mm-hmm. Thank you both. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But before we end, let's just say uh, you two have created something new that will be more apparent on the earth. It's true. Yes. Yes. We yes. we got to participate in the <laughs> in uh, human recreation. <laughs> yeah, well, it, so, it, re- it requires some degree of recreation to recreate, and so uh, yes. you have a new. We don't have to get into that craft. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that for the moment. But uh, so excited yeah. for how the two of you will further live out. Uh, your sense of calling, vocation, and avocation uh, through the process of this new being about to arrive. So before we end, let me just say that uh, even if you're not particularly uh, in the uh, need for furniture, you're going to just absolutely <laughs> love to take in. It's almost like going through a beautiful museum, but check out. This is Urban Made. You can spell that out. I don't need to do it. This is UrbanMade.com. And to see some of Jordan's work, as well as JordanDowell.com. We can put all that stuff somewhere. But I just want people to know that uh, there's beauty and your lives, both of you, uh, have offered us such a taste of how craft grows beauty, not only in what's produced, but in the character of the one who listens well. So thank you. Thank you. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.